Did you know that Chicken McNuggets come in four shapes? The boot, the bell, the bow tie, and the ball? Yeah, shapes aren't random. You'll see these four shapes over and over again in every box the world over. McDonald's has standardized them to, quote, ensure consistent cooking time for food safety. Weird fact, by the way, the boot overwhelmingly tends to be people's favorites in the polls about this sort of thing. But despite the four different shapes, there's one thing that they all share, a history of deep fried lies. Hope you're hungry, friends. This one is gonna be spicier than that limited edition Szechuan sauce. Internet, welcome to Food Theory, the show that brings the num nums straight to your tum tums. And today's num num is the delectable yet questionable chicken McNugget, a food item that honestly I thought I'd overgrown as I approached my adult years, but now that I have a three year old, it's a food item that's forcibly reinserted itself back into my life and my diet. These things keep pulling me back in. I wish I knew how to quit you. Then why don't you? Why don't you just let me be, huh? Let's face it, at this point in my life, I eat more of these things than a six-year-old after soccer practice. For most of us, the Chicken McNugget has been a staple throughout our entire lives. I'm sure almost all of us have at least one fond memory of going to McDonald's and getting that McNugget Happy Meal. I mean, some nugs and a toy? Can life get any better? According to sources, yes. Yes, it can. But what I want to chew on today isn't the crispy golden crust on the outside of these things. It's the conspiracy that lies buried in the middle. You see, the origin of the Chicken Nugget is anything but golden. A domino of lies that gave rise to the world's favorite poultry-based snack. If you've watched this channel before, you know that what we eat and how we eat it has more to do with advertising, PR, and legal maneuvers than it has to do with your taste buds. And the creation of the Chicken McNugget is a prime example. The Chicken Nugget was first tested in McDonald's in 1980, but it wasn't because Ray Kroc wanted to expand his diner's palates. It was because he was practically being forced to by the entire industry of American media. In the end, these little golden rounds are the product of four major lies. And no amount of sweet and sour sauce is gonna make this one taste any better. So that, my friends, is our journey today. Exposing the four mistruths that prove our love of chicken nuggets is a lot more conspiracy than coincidence. But in order to understand what's going on, we're all gonna need to become chicken nugget historians, so let's rewind all the way back to the caveman days. You know, before the existence of the dollar menu. Back in the 1950s and 60s, so this is 30 years before the iconic boot-shaped nuggets started appearing on the McDonald's menu, a man by the name of Ansel Keys was starting to establish himself as one of the most famous nutrition scientists in the world. His reputation had started to take off after working for the US military to develop K-rations, a daily package of food for paratroopers that provided 3,200 calories a day and was rated as better than nothing by test groups. Shortly after, he began gathering data on the health and diets of different populations to try and find the relationship between the food certain cultures eat and the illnesses that they exhibit, with a particular emphasis on heart disease. One of his first and most famous discoveries came from corporate executives living in Minnesota. He saw that they were dying of heart disease at much higher rates despite being some of the best fed people in the world. On the other end, over in post-World War II Europe, despite reduced food supplies, cardiovascular disease rates had decreased sharply. This led Keyes to determine that diet was actually a big factor with heart health. Eventually, he concluded that the high in milk, high in red meat diet of the Minnesota businessmen resulted in heightened cholesterol levels and ultimately heightened risk of death by heart disease. From there, he turned his attention globally. He noticed that, of anywhere in the world, southern Italy had the highest concentration of centenarians, people living to be a hundred. He hypothesized that their longevity had to do with the low cholesterol foods that they would eat. As such, he started preaching the good word of a low meat diet that was high in grains and olive oil, something that he would eventually brand as the Mediterranean diet. Eventually, he would launch the famous Seven Countries Study, a longitudinal study, which means it was a long one, where he followed 12,763 males across seven different countries over the course of 50 years, all in an effort to see how diets affect heart health. Time and time again, his work would come back to one thing, cholesterol. High cholesterol was causing heart disease and killing people. Ansel's findings, especially that initial Minnesota study, had a massive, and I mean a massive, impact on the U.S. government's views about cholesterol and heart disease. Suddenly, there were these major PR campaigns all against anything with fat and cholesterol. So, yay, right? People are starting to get healthier. They're 
you're learning about the dangers of cholesterol. Sign me up for my diet of bread and shots of olive oil, right? Well, herein comes line number one. Ansel didn't have the full picture and covered up any results that suggested his lack of knowledge. You see, by 1968, he was already famous, and he performed the Minnesota Coronary Study, where he tried to replace highly saturated fat diets with diets that would lower people's total cholesterol. His hypothesis was that by lowering people's cholesterol, he would stop them from getting heart disease. Unfortunately, this study failed. It concluded that, quote, replacement of saturated fat in the diet effectively lowers serum cholesterol, but does not translate to a lower risk of death from coronary heart disease. In short, the patients in the study had lower cholesterol, sure, but they were still dying of heart diseases at the same rates. This study would go mysteriously unpublished. Hmm, can't imagine why he wouldn't publish research that directly disproved his entire professional platform. Must have gotten lost on his desk or something. Honestly, we only know about the existence of the study because the results were discovered in 2013, over 50 years later. Turns out Keyes had discovered cholesterol, but he had no idea about the differences between good and bad cholesterol and he didn't want to telegraph that out into the world. He also wasn't taking into account other lifestyle factors, like the fact that the Minnesota corporate executives were sedentary, drank heavily, and were almost all smokers, all of which have been shown to cause heart disease. Science is kind of tricky that way. It's almost like sharing all of the information both for and against your hypothesis is important for the education of the masses, but uh, nah, screw that, I've got a brand to maintain. And by that point, it was just too late. The wheels of advertising against the enemy of cholesterol were already in motion, and beef was public enemy number one, and was put in that position by liar number two, Big Tobacco. You see, another major contributor to heart disease, smoking, was surging in popularity all through the 50s, with nearly 10 cigarettes sold per adult per day. And it was known at the time that smoking was a major cause of heart disease. Kind of. You see, beginning in 1948, the Framingham study became the first major piece of science to show that cigarette smoking was a major risk factor for a whole myriad of health problems, including, of course, heart disease. But Big Tobacco fought it off. The Council for Tobacco Research funded counter studies for over a decade to cast doubt on the results and shift blame to other causes. So by the time Ansel Keys started attacking beef, tobacco companies were already well practiced at shifting blame to other places. The less centralized beef industry didn't have the sophistication or the lobbying power that the tobacco companies had to fight their reputation for being unhealthy, so cigarette consumption kept going up while beef consumption went down. Not because of science, but because of publicity. And as you might imagine, this didn't bode too well for McDonald's in the 1960s. At the time, it just had over a thousand restaurants in operation and basically two things on the menu, burger and fries. Cholesterol with a side of fat. The beef industry was already starting to feel that U.S.'s shift away from cow and towards the lower cholesterol alternatives of chicken and turkey, but in 1977, the pressure got turned up even more. The U.S. published what's now considered a controversial nutrition guideline all about cutting fat out of everyone's diet and realigning to this old friend, the food pyramid. In recent years, it's been revealed that the food pyramid was actually highly misleading. A theory for another day, to be sure. But at the time, this was the guidance that everyone followed. It had a huge impact on the food market, which was now being strongly forced to shift to white meat chicken as the alternative protein to fatty beef. And looking back at McDonald's, they're over here for the last decade like Jordan Peele sweating profusely trying to figure out what to do. So, how about line number three? Steal someone's recipe. In 1963, a man named Robert Baker came up with a recipe for a little something something called the chicken stick. Y yeah, it's it's not a very appealing sounding name, but that's because the dude was a scientist and not some sort of marketing genius. Robert Baker was a professor of poultry science. Yep, real thing, from Cornell University and is responsible for more than 40 different poultry products ranging from chicken nuggets to turkey burgers. This guy was so prolific when it came to cooking bird meat that he was inducted into the American Poultry Hall of Fame. Also apparently a real thing. God bless you, Robert Baker. He didn't patent his chicken sticks right away, so McDonald's was able to sweep in and take credit for his invention, including his whole method for making them. The method involves taking finely chopped white meat chicken, skin and spices, as well as maybe some breading to bind it, grinding it up into a regular consistency, breading it twice, then flash freezing it to bind everything together real well. At the time of cooking, it's deep fried and fat directly out of the freezer and served. Thus, the Chicken McNugget was born, and with it, McDonald's finally had on its menu a healthier, lower cholesterol alternative to burgers. R right? Right? Wrong on so many levels. So wrong that 
it's actually line number four. While McDonald's absolutely met the letter of what the media was pushing towards, serving lean white meat chicken in their restaurants, they managed to skirt around the intention of creating a healthier alternative to hamburgers. Let's just compare the nutrition facts of a McDonald's hamburger to a McDonald's six-piece chicken McNugget, which both, conveniently enough, have the same calorie count, 250 calories, thereby making this a fair comparison. Total fat in the burger, nine grams. Total fat in the nuggets, 15. Total saturated fat in the burger, three and a half grams, versus the nuggets, two and a half grams, which I guess is one gram win for upending the entire American beef industry. But let's look at the thing that drove this whole controversy in the first place, cholesterol. McDonald's hamburger, 30 milligrams. McDonald's chicken McNuggets, 40. A hamburger actually has 25% less cholesterol than the nuggets. Even though the entire invention of the nugget was driven by America's obsession with lowering their cholesterol in the 1970s, McDonald's effectively made a less healthy alternative to a hamburger in response to the public's demand for a healthier alternative to the hamburger. And they 100% got away with it. I mean, there's a reason chicken nuggets are a mainstay of McDonald's menus around the world. These things are delicious. And the reason they're really delicious is maybe because they're kind of bad for you. All that said, if you think this episode is me putting on a poor beef moment, or that I'm a secret member of Big Beef, which ironically has adopted some of Big Tobacco's old playbook in recent years, I'm not. I do love a great steak as much as the next guy, but my New Year's resolution is to eat healthier, just like the next guy. In researching for healthy lifestyle choices in 2022, I did find out something in a fun twist. Ansel Keys? He might have been onto something. He did, in fact, live to be 100, so minus the completely unethical cover-up of his research, there's evidence that the Mediterranean diet is a good one for lots of other reasons. Just, you know, not preventing heart attacks. And even though we know that the Mediterranean diet isn't the end-all be-all of nutrition solutions, it doesn't mean that beef is off the chopping block either. The World Health Organization recently declared red meat as a carcinogen, you know, something that causes cancer. And there's been a big emphasis on its potential environmental concerns as well, so there's plenty still left here to debate. All that said, whatever your path to health may be in 2022, remember that the food you're choosing is often dictated by the advertising that you see, not the rigorous scientific studies that we're all clearly reading. We all probably should be reading, to be honest. If you want to actually know what's healthy, read the nutrition facts to decide if that incredibly deep fried chicken is actually better for you than the filet mignon. Or, you know, you could always make your New Year's resolution subscribing to this channel. I'm here to do all that research for you and digest it down into a nice tasty bite. Now, if you'll excuse me, this episode's made me incredibly hungry, so I'm gonna go grab a burger, but maybe like a turkey burger or something. Anyway, remember, it's all just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit.